Oh. There it goes. Had a little technical difficulty. Okay. If I don't say this, the kids will say, Daddy, you didn't say it. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Father in heaven, thank you for your words. Thank you for your life. Uh, your You breathe in us your grace and we breathe out your praise to quote, um, your grace finds me. Jesus, may your words have its full effect. Use us as broken vessels, broken vessels that we are, to communicate um, what these, what you want to tell us, Lord. And if there's something that um, that we were originally going to say that you had said before and decided, you know what, something else needs to be said, then Holy Spirit, we lay it aside. We 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 lay it down. Jesus said. Have thine own will, O Lord. Have thine own will. Thou art the potter, and we are the clay. Thank you. Have thine own way. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, and we bless you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. You're still going. Okay, so, um, seal five. I didn't do a little PowerPoint thingy. I ran out of time. So, um, entitled this one, Gaining God's Heart. And um, I want to start back uh, sort of remembering where we came from. Um, we started with the conversation about what God's intention was towards us. We, um, When God created us, He created the heavens and the earth, and then He put mankind into a garden that He planted. Um, he had an intention with His design and with His creation. And that intention was to have a relationship with us. And so we talked about how mankind was created in the image and likeness of God. And so if we sort of made our little bullseye here of our body, I've added people. Now he looks like a person with a bullseye in his belly. Um, he was, we recognize that there's a body that interacts with the world. There's the soul that is our personality, mind, will, and emotions. And then there was a spirit, right? And that spirit is the organ that was used to communicate with God. God was outside of us. It says in in um, Genesis that he would walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. So whether he walked and it was uh, literal walking next to, like maybe the pre-incarnate Christ, or whether it was a sensing of the presence of God and his spirit, or maybe the Father was just shining down on him, the I don't know exactly what walking looked like, but there was a relationship that was going on between God and mankind. And when God created man, he was very happy. He was very secure. He was, uh, he had significance. He had been given a job to do by God, and so he was walking in that. And he was doing that job with God. And the job that he was given was to as he walked with God, to govern the earth that he had been put on. And so God's light shined onto man, as it were, his communion with him, his, his interactions with him. And then man was to reflect that light in his realm of, of uh, atmosphere and, and authority. So the earth, the nature, the nature that was around him. He was to not govern according to his own thoughts, his own mind, his own desires, his own will. He was to govern according to the way that God had made him. So we had, you know, the trees and the animals and so forth, everything that was put underneath his feet and under his governance, he was supposed to do so reflecting what he learned from the Lord. Does that make sense? Like the moon reflects the sun. They were supposed to be like a mirror. Now, when the fall happened, 
the spirit of man became disconnected from God. It grew dark to God. And largely because what happened was there was now a new authority that was set up. An authority of the air, the prince of the power of the air now came into reign. And it, it was because Adam, who had been given authority over the earth, handed the keys over to Satan. And now Satan reigned. And there was sort of this unholy smog that came between God and man, and it distorted the message. It got filtered and distorted, and, and man's soul was cut off from God anyway. So there, there was now this distortion of what we, we understood about God. And this broke God's heart, this state, because his intention was to be in communion with us. Now, we talked about how we lost security, we lost significance, we lost acceptability to God. Instead, we felt rejected and fear and shame. And not only that, as man grew, and woman, grew in relationships between, remember the curse that fell upon mankind was that all the earthly relationships would be messed up from there on out. Husband and wife relationships, father and son relationships, everything would be messed up. So now, instead of seeing God as this loving, kind father, we saw our fathers, our personal experience with our fathers, were fathers who were not present, fathers who were abusive, fathers who were overbearing, fathers who didn't care, fathers who made demands on us that we couldn't keep, fathers who did things that they weren't supposed to do, who didn't have our best interest. And we started to think maybe the human fathers that we had that were not kind to us were like God our Father. And so we started to project that human understanding of fatherhood onto God the Father himself. And God kept trying to speak to us his goodness and his grace and his love and his mercy and his forgiveness, but it all got distorted in this smog of Satan's kingdom and his reign. And so, in due time, God sent the word to us. He did so, actually, through Israel first. And he gave them the Torah, and he said, this is a, a representation of my love for you and my character towards you. And I put it in words. I put it down on paper because, you know, if it's on, maybe not paper, stone, if it's, if it's chiseled out, if it's written down, it can't get distorted, right? You know, I had someone tell me that. I write it down because if I write in my brain, it gets sort of, I, I can mess it up. But if I write it down, there it is in black and white. It's the truth, and I can see it. And so God wrote down his instructions for his people in the Torah so they could understand clearly who God was. And it was a reflection of his character and his interactions with his people and, and how they could come to him and relate to him. But even that got distorted. You know, there was this, this thing where people, they would learn the instructions of God and they'd try to obey them and then they found themselves falling into this, I can't obey, so maybe I need to study more. And so then that would just increase their inability to obey because it wasn't knowledge that they lacked in their brain. It was the ability through their will to do what God was requiring of them. It didn't make the law bad. It just made our inability evident. So what did God do? He sent his son as a human on earth. Sorry, this is a really bad, bear with me, really bad stick figure, pretend it's Jesus. Okay, so he was not like this though. He was intact. Body, soul, and spirit, the second Adam. Now, he had a flesh that was subject 
to all the sin curses of this system because he was still under the smog of the power of Satan owning this earth. But he was perfect in his soul and perfect in his spirit. And he heard and obeyed what his father said perfectly. So in one sense, he came to be that representation of how to live out the Torah rightly. If you were going to live out the Torah, the instructions of God, and you did it perfect, this is what it would look like. It would look like Jesus. Right? Not only that, but God's Spirit was on him, and in fact, in him, and so he didn't just have God, you know, coming down on him and him reflecting. He was emanating light. In fact, in John it says, I am the light. The light shining out of my cavern of a body, out to you. And so under the smog of the earth, he was now the light walking in the midst of the people. That light which darkness hated, darkness fled from, darkness had to kill because darkness can't stand the light. If you read John, this is the, the primary image he uses is the light and the darkness all the way throughout that book and then in First John and so forth. He uses this idea of light versus darkness. The world is darkened in their sin. Jesus said that he came to defeat the works of the devil and that all things would change when he was raised up from the earth and in the being raised up from the earth, he would draw all of men's hearts to himself. This was spoken just days before he would walk to the cross. And we talked about last week how the, the fourth seal gives us a picture of sacrifice and death. And death and death's domain had authority over a quarter of the earth. And they could take that quarter, they could render the sword or death or famine or the wild beast to that quarter. And I really was perplexed about this. I didn't mention it last week because I didn't have an answer as to why it was a quarter. <laughs> I didn't I didn't get it. But I had been asking the Lord, I said, Lord, what is it about the quarter? It doesn't make sense in my brain. Well, as we've talked about this whole thing, this is the maturing process of the saint, which means that this the person who's walking through these different seals, if you will, and the plan of God is being revealed in their life progressively, they already have a relationship with God, which means that some things have fundamentally happened to them. They have a new heart that's able to hear God and able to respond to God. They have a spirit that's new, that's been given to them. The organ that was darkened back here because of the fall has been re recreated so it can actually hear and receive the word of God. And according to Ezekiel 36, 26, they're also given the spirit of God that's upon them. So they have, in, in effect, if we were to draw our bullseye here, they have the body, they have a soul, they have a spirit that is connected to the Holy Spirit, right? And this here is how many parts? Is it? Four. There's four there. Uh, in the Old Testament, if you were to make an analogy, it would be the fourth man in the fire. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and the man of God in the midst. Yes, yeah, the fourth man in the fire. So death and death's domain only has authority over one quarter of this individual. Which quarter do you think it is? Body. The body. He can kill that. He can't touch your soul, your spirit, or the Holy Spirit at all. That's why Jesus says, don't fear man who can kill the body. That's it. That's right. So... This all is, is set up. I want to also remind you that um, the reason why the seal, why Jesus is worthy to open up the seals, is because He walked through them all Himself. 
So there's four different things that were listed that could happen under death's domain, under the authority of this earth. Okay? One was the sword. And, and that is in relation to someone else coming from outside of you and killing you. You know? Most people don't kill themselves with the sword. I guess you could have suicide. But for the most part, it's somebody else coming against you. And while Jesus laid down his life and no one took his life from him, it is undeniable that he did not nail himself to the cross. Someone else did that for him. Okay? Second is death, and he literally physically died. He was physically put into the grave, and he physically rose again. He had a famine experience because he didn't eat after the Passover meal that he shared with his disciples, and he thirsted on the cross. He was lacking in basic clothing. He was literally hanging out there. He was naked and hanging. If you couldn't be secure, he was he was the most insecure person there. He was rejected by his father and everybody else, his followers, they all left and so forth, the world and all the popularity that was there. It was all rejection. He was also tormented by the wild beast. We the analogy was the, the beast, uh, wild beast, or those impulses or things of your flesh, all the fightings within and the fears that rip you apart from the inside out. It said just before um, he went to the cross, he said, I'm in torment of my soul. This was before Gethsemane. This was the week before. I am in torment in my soul, and yet I will not ask to be released from this, the will of my Father. Every single death that we could experience, He experienced in the death on the cross. And so, as seal 4 closes, we remember that it was death that was riding on a green horse. The green horse is the horse of life that brings life. It's the death that brings life. And the next scene is actually a scene of life. And that's the fifth seal. So Revelation 6. And let's see here. It's verse... Um, Verse 9, when the Lamb broke open the fifth seal, I saw gathered on the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because they had the testimony of the Lamb. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, Sovereign Lord, holy and dependable, how long before you judge those who live on the earth and vindicate our blood on them? And each one was given a glistening white robe, and they were told to rest a little longer until the full number was fulfilled of both their fellow servants and brothers and sisters who were going to be killed just as they had been. So that's the fifth seal. One of the things to note is that the, the vision has changed. Up until this point in time, all the seals have dealt with things on the earth. Horses, charging forth in war, bringing various calamities, for the most part, here on earth. But now we see something different. We see the altar up in heaven. John is looking up at this situation, and he sees not just one person, but all these souls. It's a corporate body of souls. And they're gathered under that altar, the altar is a place of sacrifice. The altar is a place in heaven that's a little different than the altars that we have here on earth because the altars that were here on earth were all made by human people, which means they all were tainted with sin. And they were a shadow and a type, it says in Hebrews, of the things that were in heaven. So we have a perfectly made altar and on that altar, the blood of Jesus had been applied as a covering. And so the souls that had 
been gathered up there under the altar. We're finding shelter under that altar, very much in the same way that there was a covering picture in Exodus on the lintels, the doorposts of the Egypt of the Israelite uh, houses, so that the angel of death would pass over them. Okay, um, this covering was their shade and protection. These souls that are under this altar are all unified by one thing. They're unified by their testimony of the Word of God and of the Lamb. So were they righteous or unrighteous? They had been slain. Why? Because they had done well. They weren't slain because they were uh, adulterers and thieves and liars. They were slain because of their righteousness. In the same way that Abel was slain because of his brother's jealousy, it says uh, later on uh, that it was because of, uh, I believe it was in First John, because Cain was wicked and Abel was righteous. And, you know, wickedness and righteousness, they always fight against each other. These guys are all united because of what they were slain for. And they found shelter under that altar, the blood covering of Jesus. The other thing that they have in common is their cry. They cry out with a loud voice, one voice. They don't have lots of petitions. It's all the same petition. And the petition is sovereign Lord, holy and dependable, how long before you judge those who live on the earth and vindicate our blood on them? This is the same cry of the righteous blood of Abel, crying up from the ground for vengeance. You are a righteous and a holy judge. You are dependable. And, and the prophets talk about how God will judge the wicked. And so they're making a plea based off of the character of God that was revealed to them about his righteousness, his holiness, and his sovereignty. And they said, how long until you fulfill what you've said? All these martyrs are speaking with one voice. Just as all the martyrs throughout the ages have spoken with one voice. But the response is very odd. The response is, here's a robe. Yeah. This is so weird to me. You would think he would have said, you know, next Friday at 5 o'clock. That would have been a response we would have expected, a time response. But they said, here's a robe, a white robe. Here you go. Rest. And it tells us when they're supposed to rest until. But I think it's significant because what he's trying to be given to them is the heart of God. You see, the robe always is dealing with our, our actions, what we're doing. Our robes may be filthy or they may be clean. White robes, particularly glistening white robes or bright white robes, are a picture of Christ's righteousness. And they're given this bright white robe as a symbol of Christ's righteousness. Wrap yourself up in this. If you remember the parable of the king and he had a wedding feast and the people who were invited didn't want to come. And so he says, go out to the highways and byways and compel whoever to come in. But they weren't dressed for the occasion, and so the king provided robes for them so that they would be properly dressed and be part of the wedding feast. In the same way, God knows that we don't have a proper attire to be in his presence, and so he gives us robes of righteousness, not our own, but Christ's righteousness alone. And that's what we wrap ourselves in. And so these who had been slain, when were they slain? Seal 4. Yeah. That's when they were slain. So that might be not a physical off with your head kind of thing. 
it may be the flesh that was killed. Maybe an opportunity or a desire or a dream that was killed that was laid down on that altar. Maybe it was like Isaac being laid down on that altar by his father Abraham. It was the slaying of the flesh. And out of that slaying came the righteousness of God being given to them in the form of Christ's righteousness over them. And then he says, rest. Rest from your works. Hebrews tells us that all of Israel was saved out of Exodus, but not all of them entered into the promised land. They didn't receive the rest that was promised to them because they did not believe and they did not obey. And he says that if Joshua had provided the rest for the people of Israel in the promised land, then the Bible would not have elsewhere spoken that there was another rest. That rest is found in in Yeshua, in Jesus. He is our Sabbath rest. And so when these had laid aside their flesh, they were given not only the righteousness of Christ so they would not be naked, but they were also given rest in Christ. You rest from your works. And what God is doing. Until when? Until more people, brothers and sisters and servants, are slain as you were and brought in. So there's a community that God is building. And how is he building them? He's building them by walking them through the same steps that these faithful ones had walked. Until they learn to be loyal to the Word of God and to the Lamb. Until they learn to have faith and allow God to choose their circumstances and write their story. And they're going to trust Him no matter what. Until they're willing to lay down every thought and impulse that comes from themselves and to submit to the will of God. And when they're willing to do that and become self-sacrificing, then they join a deeper level of intimacy. And five is a very special number. It is the number, uh, if you're looking at, at the, the bits of the Brit Olam, it's, it's the one that's associated with the part of the covenant that's extended to the priest. The priest is a minister of reconciliation between God and man. He's the one who works at the altar offering sacrifices, bringing people to meet their maker and helping to facilitate that. He's the one in communion. He's the one who prepares the bread and arranges it. He's the one who keeps the lit, the, the, the light lit. The, uh, Ner Tamid. He's the one who offers the incense at the incense altar. This is the the priest who is in in intercession. And this priest has an intimacy with God. And and they had special uh, set of rules that they had to observe so that they remained holy before the Lord. The high priest had that written right on his his, uh, crown. Holy to the Lord. And he always had on his shoulders... The black, remember they were onyx stones, six tribes on one side and six tribes of the other. Black, the burden, the weight of those tribes on his shoulders. But on his heart, he had beautiful stones, one for each tribe. The new Jerusalem that was being built. The same color stones that you see talked about in Revelation of all the foundations of uh, the New Jerusalem, all there. That was on his heart. And I believe that our high priest has the same thing. He bears the weight of our sin on his shoulders, but in his heart, he knows what he's creating. He knows what he's making, what he's building. And it's because of that he perseveres in opening these seals and bringing about the maturity of his bride. So he's creating a people who will be his own and be intimate with him. I think this, the probably the best expression of what he was trying to do and where he's taking us at this level is found in John 17. 
this was his Jesus' final prayer right before the Garden of Gethsemane. And he prays for his disciples. This is the maturing process sort of enumerated. It says, uh, starting in verse 6, Father, I have manifested who you really are, and I have revealed you to men and women that you have given me. They're yours, and you gave them to me, and they have fastened your word firmly to their hearts. And now at the last, they know that everything I have is a gift from you, and the very words that you gave me to speak I have passed on to them. They have received your words and carried them in their hearts. Remember those who were underneath the altar. It was for the word of God that they were slain. That testimony. They are convinced that I have come from your presence and have fully believed that you sent me to represent you. So with deep love, I pray for my disciples. I'm not asking on behalf of the unbelieving world, but for those who belong to you, those you have given me. For all who belong to me now belong to you, and all who belong to you now belong to me as well. And my glory is revealed through their surrendered lives. Holy Father, I'm about to leave the world and to return and be with you, but my disciples will remain here. I ask that by the power of your name, protect each one that you have given me and watch over them so that they will be united as one, even as we are one. While I was with these that you have given me, I kept them safe by your name that you have given me. Not one of them is lost except the one that was destined to be lost so that the scripture would be fulfilled. But now I'm returning to you, Father. I pray that they will experience and enter into my pres- my joyous delight in you so that it fulfilled in them and overflows. I have given them your message and that is why the unbelieving world hates them for their allegiance is no longer to this world because I'm not of this world. I'm not asking you that you remove them from the world, but I ask that you would guard their hearts from evil, for they no longer belong to this world any more than I do. Your word is truth, so make them holy by the truth. I have commissioned them to represent me, just as you commissioned me to represent you. And now I dedicate myself to them as a holy sacrifice, so that they will live as fully dedicated to God and be made holy by your truth. And I ask not only for these disciples, but also for those who will one day believe in me through their message. I pray for them all to be joined together as one, even as you and I, Father, are joined together as one. I pray for them to become one with us so that the world will recognize that you sent me. For the very glory you have given to me, I have given to them so that they will be joined together as one and experience the same unity that we enjoy. You live fully in me, and now I live fully in them, so that they will experience perfect unity. And the world will be convinced that you have sent me, for they will see that you love each one of them with the same passionate love that you have for me. Father, I ask that you allow everyone that you have given to me to be with me where I am. Then they will see my full glory, the very splendor you have placed upon me, because you have loved me even before the beginning of time. You are my righteous Father, but the unbelieving world has never known you in the perfect way that I know you. And all those who believe in me also know you have sent me. I have revealed to them who you are, and I will continue to make you even more real to them so that they may experience the same endless love that you have for me. For your love will now live in them even as I live in them. Particularly the last section of this really gets the heart of Yeshua. This is his final prayer to his father, his final intercession. And he says, I have come as a witness to you. And I have done all that you've asked me to do. You commissioned me to come here and I did it. And now I'm commissioning these guys to go out and represent me. And it's this sort of this uh, passing on of a mantle, if you will. 
one generation to the next, from God the Father to the Son, the Son to His disciple. And He says, here's what I really want. I want them, my disciples, to know the intimacy that I have with you. And I want to be intimate, just like I want to go back to you and I want to be intimate with you. I want them to be intimate with me. And not only that, I want them to be intimate with each other. And then we can all be in one joyous, delightful communion. That was the point. That was the point from the Garden of Eden when God created man was to have this communion, this delightful, joyful communion. But it was stolen before it barely got started. And so now Jesus came so that he could restore that and his final prayers made that happen. Just as I am one with you. And in Ezekiel 35, there's a prophecy that's given. I believe it's a 30, 35, maybe 36. He's, he's talking about how God's going to restore everything. But he makes the comment, it will be better than the first go around. It's where God is going to restore us. It's not going to be back to where it was in Eden. It's actually going to be better. Because now God's Spirit will reside within us. And since... Instead of just talking with God, That's right. You'll be in, in unbroken communion and fellowship with Him. Oh, Christ you step from being in you. Family. That's oh, right. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's it. You go from being a friend to family. That's exactly it. Now, Christ shines not... You're not a reflection of God any longer. You're not watching His character and trying to just imitate it. Okay? You are emanating it, not imitating it. When you imitate it, you copy it. When you emanate it, it means it's coming from deep inside of you and shining out. It's your character. That's why you don't have to try. Because if God's inside of you, you can't help yourself but to obey the Lord. You can't help yourself if you walk before God in humility. If you walk in humility before Him, laying down your own flesh desires, then He will shine through you and you won't even have to try. There is no striving it is all rest. That's why these ones underneath the altar were handed the righteousness of Christ and said, Rest! There are more that are coming. There are more that are coming. And God's heart is shown here. He says, I want more to come and to enter into my rest. I want more to be gathered just as you were. And so the Father heart of God is being revealed at this moment to these who have passed through the fire. And they are now seeing with spiritual eyes. In fact, in Jesus' prayer, He says that they would, I would be able to reveal to them more how much you love me. That was part of his prayer, remember, right there at the very end. And he does so continue to reveal to us the endless love of the Father. Our Father is not like human fathers that we've seen or had experience with. Our Father God is intimate and involved. He is kind and compassionate. He's accepting and filled with joy and love. He is warm and affectionate towards us. He's always with us and eager to be with us. He's patient and slow to anger. He's loving and gentle and protective. He's trustworthy and He wants to give us a full life. 
His will is good for us and it's perfect and acceptable. He's full of grace and mercy and He gives us the freedom to fail. Mm. He is tender hearted and forgiving. His heart and His arms are always open to us. He is committed to our growth and proud of us as His beloved child. I am the apple of His eye and so are you if you claim the name of Yeshua and you are a child of God. Mm. He loves with an everlasting love and seeks only good for us. There is no punishment with God. Punishment was dealt with on the cross. I actually looked up punishment this week. Um, I was reading through First John, and he said that um, in First John, perfect love casts out all fear, and it's related to this idea of fear is from punishment. Like if you if you aren't assured of God's love for you, then you have fear that you're going to get punished. Mm. And punishment in the Greek there, and I don't remember the word exactly, but it it means tortured. It means tortured there. And that torturing of of the soul is when you're afraid that you're go you're you're gonna get whapped. But Christ was the one who took the punishment for us. And so now all that's left for us is discipline. And discipline's a totally different word. It is corrective action. It's it's moving us in the right direction so that we become more and more in the image of God. He allows us to fail and then shows us the right way to go. And it's it's out of love. The, the goal of discipline is to produce character. It's not to exact a payment. That's the goal of punishment. If you were to do wrong right now, you were to go out and, and rob a bank and you get caught and they throw you in jail, you would have to pay a certain amount of time and perhaps money and then the state would say, you have finished your debt to society. It's a payment. It's the penal system. They aren't trying to correct your behavior. They're not interested in your overall good as a person. They aren't checking in on you to say, okay, did you learn your lesson? They are not concerned with that. They're concerned with payment. And they have put amounts of years and money and probation and tied that to a some sort of payment system for ills against society. But that's not how God treats us. He's concerned, how are you looking like my son? And he will put things in our life to shape our character so that we look more and more like his son. And the more we know him, the closer the, the the closer we will grow to be like him as we remain submitted to him and he does it in his kind and gentle way as he goes through and teaches us revelation 7 which is the next chapter over gives us a view of what happens when people are submitted to this process and they grow in their intimacy and in the grace of the Lord. John is looking after, this is after the sealing of, of the tribes of, of the different people, but he looks and he sees these victorious people from every nation and tribe and group that have been gathered. Remember in seal 5 it says we're going to wait until everybody who's going to walk the same road will be gathered together. So here they are, and John's looking at them. And uh, one of the elders asked him in verse uh, 13, Who are these in the glistening white robes? And where have they come from? Remember in seal 5, they were given the robe. Now they're wearing it. And John says, Who are these guys in these glistening white robes who are wearing the righteousness of Christ? Where did they come from, the elder says to, to John. John says, Lord, you know. 
And the elder responds, he says, They are the ones who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And they have emerged from the midst of the great tribulation or the great pressure and ordeal. And for this reason, they are before the throne of God, ministering to him as priests day and night within the cloud-filled sanctuary. And the enthroned one spreads over them his tabernacle shelter. This is the same image of those who were under that altar. It's, It's what shelters them. And now they are priests unto the Lord. Remember, back before you even started with the seals, that was the intended, stated purpose of this whole process, is that he would create for himself a kingdom of priests that would reign. And here they are. It's, he did what he said he was going to do. Their souls will be completely satisfied, and neither the sun nor any scorching heat will affect them. For the Lamb at the center of the throne continuously shepherds them unto life, guiding them to the everlasting fountains of the water of life, and God will wipe from their eyes every last tear. Sometimes people will think of this particular passage as being sort of at the end of the world after everything has come to a close and they're in, you're in heaven or in the New Jerusalem or wherever and, and all is said and done. But in this very last sentence it says that he will shepherd them unto life. Well, if everything's over, do you still need to be shepherd? Shepherded? <laughs> do you have to, do you need to be led to everlasting waters of life? Will God need to still wipe away tears that apparently are falling? Or is this a presence that is going with you? Is Christ walking with you? Is he shepherding your life as the center of your throne? Is he seated seated on the center of your heart, ruling in you, and you submissive to him? And so he shepherds you from the inside out. I think it's the latter. I think it's the latter. These are the ones who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. And they're covered by him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, (coughs) for using frail vessels to achieve your means. I pray that not one of these words would return void. Lord, Father God, like the song Waymaker, even when I don't see it, you are working. In Jesus' name I ask that you would speak and show us your heart. Abba, please give us your heart. Abba, we can't even contain a fingernail worth of what you want to express to us. If you would just please baptize us in that anguish of your heart, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, So, I just have a quick message that immediately goes along with this. It's found in Luke 15, verse 11. It's a parable of the lost son. And um, the question is, do you have the Father's heart? Guys, do you have the Father's heart? So, Jesus speaking, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate. I've come into me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered, squandered his estate in foolish living. After he spent everything, a severe famine struck, uh, which Ezekiel 36, we were just talking about it, that they will not be affected by the famine. The famine of the Word of God. Now, in this case, a physical famine struck that country and he had nothing. Guys, do you understand? In your father's house, you have everything you need. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the field to feed pigs. And he longed to eat his fill from the carob pods the pigs were eating, but no one would give him any. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food, 
and here I'm dying of hunger. I'll get up, go to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired hands. So he got up, went to his father, but while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran threw his arms around his neck, kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his slaves, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it, and let's celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was dead and is alive. Again, he was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. This is where the rubber meets the road, folks. This is going to rattle some cages. Now, his older son was in the field, so he was laboring, he was working. As he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he summoned one of the servants and asked what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he sent him back safe and sound. Okay. Then, the older brother became angry. I had a note that I wrote here, jealous, bitter, critical, exclusive, and he didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. That word there, pleaded, by the way, parakleo, same word for paraclete, like the Holy Spirit. He came alongside him. He actually went out to come alongside. But he replied to his father, Look, I have been slaving. Doulos. I have been, I have been in slavery to you, many years for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my, fan, with my friends. I saw an adaptation, modern adaptation, I, I don't remember who it was, Leanne, you'll have to tell me, um, where the older son looked at his father, and it was an amazing portrayal. He points his finger at him, and he says, You owe me! And you, and you hear the father, he said, My son, he didn't, the father didn't get defensive. He said, Oh, come, please. He said, But when the son of yours came, he has devoured your assets with prostitutes, and you slaughtered a fattened calf for him. He doesn't deserve a dime. And the father doesn't get defensive. Let's look at the father's chart. He doesn't get defensive. He comes alongside the one who is self-righteous. He thinks he is good enough for the father to accept him. And, he, and the father is like, no! You are always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And I wonder what the question was to the older son. And son, you are alive and in bondage. I wrote this. I was meditating on it. And the Lord gave me this word. And hopefully, Lord, I pray that I can unpack this. Guys, Jesus coming. So this is really important. Jesus coming didn't just stop. His coming didn't just stop at rescuing us from... Things like drink, sexual immorality, thievery, lying. He, he didn't just come to rescue us from that. Those are just merely depraved attempts. They are really sick attempts at just filling a God-shaped void that is in our hearts. Jesus coming made the way to rescue us from the good attempts, the moral attempts, the responsible attempts, the good Christian thing. We need to serve God and country. We need to love the good things. All those attempts at pleasing God, and we'll even slap Jesus on it too, saying, hey, I'm a Christian, I, 
I, I, I, I'm saved. <sighs> Folks, don't deceive yourself. You're not good. I don't care how righteous you are. I don't care how cleaned up you are. Don't lose your first love. Don't forget where you came from. God restored the joy of my salvation. Don't forget where you came from. You came from the pit. Doing immorality, that's a deeper pit. That's bondage. He doesn't owe you anything. In fact, it's his blood that saves you. Not you trying hard to be a Christian. Or you trying hard to... Now you have a new set of rules. I'm, but I'm good to, to, to one another. I'm, I'm giving. And look how much I'm giving. Look how much I'm, I'm helping others. God says that doesn't mean a thing. In fact, if you look in, in all throughout Scripture, that's wickedness. Because you're doing it without His Lordship over you. You're doing it as an attempt to make Him happy. You're His son. He's already happy. With you, I'm well pleased, He said. He said that about Jesus, but we are in Jesus. He said, because these moral and responsible attempts are in fact, they're more depraved than gross sins. Why? Because they are attempts at being pure before God. You trying to get, it, it's the parable of the wedding feast where they didn't have any clothing. The king gives him clothing. Then he sees the one who's naked and he says, friend, why are you here? Huh? Why do you call him a friend? How did he get in? Well, somehow he got invited. Somehow he got in. You can't get in by yourself with your own clothes. Because they don't work in the court. You can't be pure yourself. Unless you cry. And I'm talking tears. Unless your heart's pricked. Unless you're ripped up and broken from the inside out. For God's work of the cross in you Unless that, unless that happens, friend, you could do nothing for the Lord. Nothing. It's, it's called a filthy rag. There's no intimacy. You don't weep for the things He weeps. You're not sad for the things He's sad about. You don't rejoice over the things He rejoices over. Is your heart stamped for eternity? Jonathan Edwards would say, God stamp eternity on my eyeballs. These responsible attempts are considered filth to him. Look at Cain. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all filth. You want to know the Father's heart? Forgiveness. Especially your enemies. Forgiveness of those who spit on you. Forgiveness of those who misuse you, who mistreat you, who take advantage of you. Think it, we're inconvenienced. I don't like this stupid mask on my face. Are you going to forgive? Are you going to forgive the government that they did that to you? Are you going to have the Father's heart and see that there's hurting people that don't have love? Friends, that's the Father's heart. Folks, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of of getting dirty. Don't be afraid of getting dirty among those that you would normally not want to have to deal with. Ran into a situation we were at a store the other day. The guy with some ear plugs in his ears, covered in tattoos, long bushy beard, and he had a satanic clothing on my initial response was, oh, I don't want to go near him. And God stopped me. And I looked up and I said, oh God, he needs you too. We don't want discomfort. Jesus says get uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable for him to come down as a baby. It was uncomfortable for him to work and sweat when he was in luxury. And it was uncomfortable for him to get to the cross. It was uncomfortable. Love is not comfortable. Being a father is not comfortable. You're up in the middle of the night. You want to just sit and listen to devotions and or with friends and stink at their inconveniences. It's uncomfortable. 
God says, are you going to do it anyway? And smile and rejoice. Folks, if you're listening to this, the altar call is, do you have the Father's heart anguish to look past the pettiness of this world? Guys, please turn. We're in revival season before it's too late that the scripture may be fulfilled that the hearts of the fathers be turned to the children lest God comes and strikes the land with a terrible curse. Lord Jesus, I pray your baptism over us of anguish of the Father's heart for a lost city, for a lost country, for a country that confuses gender, for a country that kills its faith, for it kills its babies and not willing to lift a finger to help our neighbor. For a country that is so inconvenienced on the road and wants to be politically correct to us to not hurt anybody's feelings and not tell the truth. Father, your heart was to reach down to the very bowels of ours to show us our need of you. Oh God, don't let us be complacent. Holy Spirit, don't let us fail. Don't You promise not to cast us headlong. Jesus, as revival is... Uh, revival meeting is going to be here soon. Father, I pray that you prepare every heart and soul that would hear. Father, I pray that whatever you do with these words, it's in the valleys that the battle is fiercest. Oh, Jesus, that you would raise a banner. That when the enemy comes in like a flood, that you would raise a banner over it in Jesus' name. Because your banner over us is love. Vediglo alai ahava. Your banner over us is love. In Jesus' name, we pray for a renewal singular vision in Jesus name Amen